Welcome to the USC IIGH Virtual Lecture Series. My name is Cynthia Greskin, and as Director of the USC Institute on Inequalities and Global Health, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this incredibly exciting event. For those of you who don't know, as part of the Institute's vision and commitment to building a more just and healthy world, we traditionally bring global health leaders to USC to share their experience and to engage with students and faculty across common themes of interest and all with a particular focus on understanding and addressing health inequalities here in Los Angeles and around the world. And given COVID this year, we like everyone else are doing things a bit differently. And given the virtual nature of things, we're able to operate across several time zones in ways that can allow events like this to occur. Where our fabulous keynote speaker is joining us from Ethiopia, even as most of us are here in LA. So we're really grateful. And we're very excited to have Dr. Spaseha with us, a speaker for a talk that if I can say could not be more timely. Our hope in asking Dr. Faseya to speak on power, privilege, and reproductive justice in global health is not only to shed light on the inequalities and asymmetrical power structures that we know are ingrained in global health structures, but to enlighten and to help give some direction to the good and hard conversations that are happening this year about what we can all do to change and to address this. So with a particular focus on reproductive justice, the idea is to spark a more long-term conversation about the challenges that are posed by the current structures and systems of global health, wherever it is that we live, not just for Southern California, and in particular with attention to those with limited resources and where there are long-standing inequities. And from there to help move us beyond simply acknowledgement of the issues and concern, but actually into some form of action. And so with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Paseja, but honestly, honestly, it's hard to know where to start or where to stop. So let me try to make it brief. As you will see, Dr. Paseja is a thought leader and a change agent. She's a reproductive endocrinology specialist. She's a physician, she's a lawyer. She has a long history with the University of Michigan and she now serves in two critically important roles Director of Global Programs at the Susan Thompson Buffett Foundation and Chief Advisor to the Director General of the World Health Organization. She is globally recognized as a leader in reproductive health and rights. She's a lifelong gender champion. And honestly, she's an inspiration to many of us for not only the work that she does, but what she brings to her work. And with that, Dr. Paseya, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Professor Greskin and, and Howard. It's wonderful to see you. And thank you to the USC Institute on Equalities and Global Health for inviting me here today. I sincerely hope you don't end up regretting inviting me because I have begun to make a habit of making people feel very uncomfortable. Um, I hope you will allow me uh, that today because I believe the times we're living in call for that. Um, in fact, if you have not been uncomfortable yet this year, you may not have been awake at all. Uh, this has been a year of great discomfort, uh, but why? The elements are not new. Uh, we have lived through pandemics. We've watched the evils of white supremacy play out. We've, been, we've seen climate changing. We have hopefully reflected on our role in all of it, but not like this year. Uh, everything was amplified to new heights and broadcast more widely. The violence of white supremacy, millions of needless deaths around the world, uncertainty, loss, injustice, outrage. Yet from discomfort, if we lean into it, if we allow to shake us to the core, can come transformation. By the end of our time together today, I want you to not only be uncomfortable, but perhaps even committed to staying that way. Whether you've lost someone due to COVID this year or have opened your eyes in new ways to the very painful inequities we have accepted for so long, we are in a sea change moment. We are facing a new frontier of reality. The reality we're in today is changing absolutely everything we know about global health and for good. What an intense and overwhelming time to be just starting out 
or continuing your career in global health, global health. I really applaud you for being here today because you know, despite all those difficulties, here you are. If you're here today, it means you have survived and that is something to celebrate in and of itself. It also means that you are a deeply privileged person in some way. The two facts are not coincidence. You know, most of the young people I meet or have thought at elite universities like this one have chosen this field because they want to do good. They want to help others solve big intractable issues like health inequity. They want to take on broken systems or dismantle oppressive ones. That's wonderful because we need you. But before you do any of that, or rather in order to do any of that, you need to start from where you are. I wish the circumstances were such that we could be together in one room, but I'm really grateful I can speak to you tonight from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, as Professor Greskin introduced. Where we not only are dealing with the COVID pandemic, but also a conflict in the Northern Tigray region, which has disproportionately ravaged women and girls. It's really utterly heartbreaking. Most of us you know, in this room have spent the last 12 months or so in our homes. We're very privileged. For many of us in global health who traveled frequently, this is a totally new experience. You know, For someone like me prior to COVID, I used to travel for almost 80% of my time. I hardly would adjust to a time zone before I would be in another. Now, home has never been so important or meant so much. By home, I'm of course talking about your apartment or your house, but also your community, your neighborhood and everything that compromises it. Comprises it, sorry. The closest place you can safely get groceries or access, access urgent care should you need it. By home, I also mean you, your identity and the privilege it brings. This is the foundation from which you operate in the world, whether you realize it or not. Your home is your story. You know, it's the history from which you have arrived and it's the root of the impact, whether harmful or positive you will go on to make through the rest of your life. So I would invite you to take a moment and reflect on that home. Who are you and why are you here today? Maybe you're thinking, you know, where is she going with that? Um, I came to listen to a lecture on reproductive justice and global health. You know, maybe some statistics and some career and inspiration so that you can go on with your day. I'm asking you to think very deeply and continuously about who you are and the privilege you bring, because that is the most radical thing you can do right now to potentially transform global health. As individuals affiliated with American University, an American university like USC, you must know that the legacy of white supremacy is baked into the very foundation whether that manifests itself, you know, manifested itself in the past as slavery in the US or colonialism in other countries around the world, it's the legacy of global health today. Across the US and Europe, we now have institutions for inequality, you know, such as your own or focused on decolonizing it. This is a critical and very important step, but we have to question the fitness of the very institutions that are perpetrated operation to lead the charge to root it out. Asata Shakur, the black freedom fighter, said that nobody in history has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of the people who are oppressing them. It's not that each of us doesn't have a powerful role to play, but in reflecting in our stories and our privileges, we have to ask ourselves where our seat should be. You know, can a former colonizer now be the decolonizer in global health? The term global health in and of itself has never referred to places like the United States and Europe, despite the vast 
health inequities that exist here in the US as well. Rather, global health has been used, especially for those of us in wealthy countries and elite institutions to really mean helping or solving problems for communities, not our own, experiencing realities we may never have and living thousands of miles away. Global health has always been about those people that are over there. It is an immense privilege to be removed from the problems you're trying to solve. But actually, in reality, it's a massive misstep. It leads to blind spots and oversimplified solutions to very complex problems and ultimately the perpetuation of the very systems of operation many of us would like to say we are working against. That's why today I'm telling you it must start with you. Start with where you are. The health inequities that many of you hope to address elsewhere are playing out right here, right now in your own communities. You know, for instance, with Los Angeles, there's huge disparities impacting who has the privilege of staying home to avoid COVID-19 exposure, who gets COVID-19 care, and how good that care is. You know, overall, for example, officials estimate one in three in Los Angeles County have been infected with COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic. However, as I'm sure you're aware, these cases are not equally distributed. In and around South, Southern, South Central Los Angeles, about one in six people have been infected with COVID, far higher than wealthier pockets out in the city, cities like Santa Monica, where the numbers are closer to one in 23. These places are less than 15 miles apart, but their realities could not be more different almost as different as Los Angeles and Ethiopia. The New York Times published a story last month about two fathers, both undocumented immigrants who contracted COVID and later died at MLK Community Hospital, a health center that desperately is trying to serve low-income neighborhoods that are being disproportionately pummeled by this virus. I believe this is about less than 10 miles from your campus. It's a powerful story because it lays bare the many layers of structural and institutional injustice that ultimately led to the infection and death disparities that we are seeing today. We're seeing this play out in vaccinations too. You know, earlier this month, the Los Angeles County Department of Health released data showing that twice the percentage of white seniors have received the vaccine compared to black seniors. This virus is very dangerous, but again, it's the backdrop of racist and broken systems we have allowed to persist for so long, it is absolutely deadly. So that's just one small sliver of what's happening right now in your home communities. So let me tell you a little bit about my home and my community and where I'm coming from. Right now, although I'm speaking to you from Addis, my new home is Kigali, Rwanda. We were supposed to receive the first official distribution of vaccines in February, but now it's being to pushed to March. Kigali hasn't always been my home or my community. I moved here just a few months ago, actually. For over 30 years, I have lived in the United States. That's where I met my husband, that's where I went to school, that's where my four children were born and raised. I trained as a physician and a lawyer in rural Illinois, knowing that I wanted to focus on the greatest intersection of oppression and public health anywhere, reproductive health and rights. Abortion is basic health care, and health is a human right. Whether or not the United States recognize it does not make it less true. For many years, I saw patients as a reproductive endocrinologist and taught graduates such as yourself at the University of Michigan. That's where Howard and I met. I gave lectures on global health inequality. I worked to help individuals exercise their reproductive rights, whether that was to have a pregnancy, 
prevent or terminate one. Later, in 2015, I moved my family to Omaha, Nebraska. That was home for me almost for the last five and a half years. I was at home there this summer with my children when I watched in horror in the spring of 2020, along with the rest of the world as George Floyd was murdered in broad daylight. It took my breath away, I'm sure, as it did yours. And I was not expecting that, you know, after having lived in the United States for 30 years and as a black woman and as an immigrant, as an African, I did not think that was possible because believe me, I know something about racism and injustice. I didn't always though. I was born and raised in Ethiopia. When I was growing up, it was a communist country but one of the only countries in Africa that was never colonized. My father was an exceptional human being and ahead of his time, really. He raised his daughters to believe in our core that we are highly capable and valuable and could do anything that we put our minds to. He raised us to believe that we could transcend any expectation society placed on us. No one could tell me that I was inferior to them when I moved to the United States. And I believe that, and I still do believe that. While I grew up witnessing gender and socioeconomics inequities all around me, relatives out of school, married before you know they were ready, I have seen friends and family giving birth at a young age, racial inequity was not really present in my mind until I moved to the United States. But once you see racism or experience it, you never unsee it. You begin to notice it absolutely everywhere. You think perhaps it will fade as you advance in your career or the more you accomplish, but it really doesn't. In fact, it gets worse. This has been the backdrop of my entire career in global health. Yet the very public lynching of George Floyd shook me to my core in a new way. You know, in him, I saw someone who could have been my father, my husband, my brother, or one of my sons. Weeks later, my sons took to the street like millions of others across the US to peacefully protest for black lives. Black lives which have been commodified, denigrated and dehumanized in the country for centuries. But as a mother, I just broke. I was so heavy with the weight of the fear, the anxiety, and that the utter exhaustion I had carried for so long raising black children in the United States. And realizing that no matter how well I educate them, how much privilege we had, ultimately, I may not be able to protect them. My husband and I made the decision at that point to protect our family, reloc relocating our family for the time being for Ru to Rwanda. For the first time in many decades, we were not the only Black people around, and that felt pretty good. But I do have mixed emotions, knowing it was a privilege that we could just get up and leave in an unjust system that so many others cannot. And in fact, my children challenged me, saying, Mom, if you are getting up and leaving, who's going to speak up? But in that moment, I had to do whatever it was in my power to protect my children and my family. I wanted to share this personal story with you for two reasons. First is to just really underscore that we do not live single issue lives. You know, Audre Lorde said that we live complex lives where we experience the intersection of power and oppression. So we cannot approach our work as global health leaders with any less complexity. 
Racial injustice is health and equity. Sexism and racism conspire. Racism, misogyny, economic injustice often go hand in hand. That is the reality from which reproductive justice was born. Secondly, is really to point out that you cannot truly skip an inequitable system by moving from one part of it to another. The only way is to transform the system itself. In just one week, it will be 30 years since Rodney King was savagely beaten by four Los Angeles policemen while more than a dozen stood by and watched. I know many of you may not have been born at that time, but I hope you know the history. I remember protests and riots that followed and we thought it might be a turning point in the United States. But history repeats itself until we learn the right lessons and get all the way to the root of the problem. In global health, we have so often focused on symptoms. We have focused on single issues, malaria, HIV, pneumonia, under five, you know, stunting, maternal health, things that we can easily fund and measure and hopefully eradicate. All the while ignoring the underlying systems of injustice and the intersectionality of our lives or the lives of those that we're trying to help. Even when it comes to reproductive health, ensuring access to abortion or contraception is crucial, but not enough to ensuring reproductive liberation. If abortion is legal, but misogyny, racism, and patriarchy are still alive and well, how much progress will we ever really make? So what I'm challenging you today is to commit to never seeing an issue in singularity. Challenge yourself to see the entire system, to keep your eyes open so that you see the totality around you. You cannot change the system until you actually see the system. It may be uncomfortable for you, especially if you are a good-hearted and well-meaning mostly in the room, white people in global health and those that work in the field to realize that you have benefited of a system of white supremacy that has at the very same time abused and exploited so many others. We all have benefited. It should be uncomfortable. That is just the reality. Now, what are you going to do about it is the question. You know, privilege is a tool you have and you must never forget that. If you're not using it intentionally to dismantle or to build, to actively repair or rebalance power, then you're using it to do harm. That's it. There is no in-between. There is no neutral here. The injustices that you notice in your own communities are microcosms of injustices on a national and global scale. Who has a voice and who doesn't? Who has the power to make decisions and who doesn't? Who has the resources to, to implement them and who doesn't? That's what we're talking about. Often this power, power dynamics are revealed by, is, by what is left undone and whose needs slip through the cracks. In the case of COVID-19 and so many other health emergencies, White supremacy and systemic gender inequalities are causing major gaps in the response nationally and globally. Outside of LA, the pandemic impact also runs along racial and socioeconomic lines. Nationwide, Black and Latino Americans are dying of COVID-19 at three times the rate of white people and being hospitalized at a rate four times higher, according to the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Already, Black Americans who've been disproportionately at risk of this virus are receiving COVID vaccinations at dramatically lower rates than white Americans. So if we zoom out, 
the view is much the same. You know, in the US, you've been following, we've administered over 64 million doses of vaccines as of February 23rd. However, worldwide, 130 countries have yet to administer a single COVID vaccine dose today. So far, 10 developed countries have procured 75% of the vaccine supply. This map shows that most African countries will have to wait until 2023 to get vaccinated, if ever. Meanwhile, Canada has enough doses to vaccinate its population five times over. And the United States that has three to 4% of the world population has purchased or procured 26.1% of the available vaccine stocks. This is quite simply called a catastrophic moral failure as the WHO Director General has said. And finally, as crises always do, COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted women and girls in myriads of ways. Across the board, women are more likely to have lost a job as a direct result of the pandemic and are shouldering the burden of unpaid labor like childcare or elderly care. In the United States, 140,000 jobs were lost in December, all of them held by women and mostly women of color, black and Latino women. In the same token in Kenya and other developing countries, there have been a surge of teenage pregnancy as schools closed that normally serve as a safety net for adolescent girls. Globally, the Guttmacher Institute projects an additional 3 million unsafe abortions as a result of the pandemic disruption of essential services. So it's no wonder that women around the world are almost three times as likely as men to report significant mental health consequences from this pandemic. We're truly bearing so much. This power imbalances are much bigger than COVID-19. These trends play out across the intersections of global health, from COVID to malaria to sexual and reproductive health. Many of us have long recognized these patterns and talked about how to fix them, but they have not changed. Newton's first law of motion states that a body at rest will remain at rest unless an outside force acts upon it. So the status quo will prevail unless we allow this time in history to make us so uncomfortable, to move us so deeply that we think and act and mobilize in ways that we never have done before. How do we change it? I certainly don't have all the answers, but I have some ideas I want to leave you with. First, each one of us needs to reflect deeply on our role in the status quo. Remember, start where you are. This is not a one-time act. This is a daily, even momentary commitment. If you're not from the community that you are working to serve, I'm not saying you don't have a role to play. We all do, but you should be actively questioning what that role is or ought to be. If you come to this work with privilege, and each one of us do, you need to think very carefully about how you use that privilege and the space you take up. For many of us, being an active part of transformative change will mean stepping out, stepping down, and passing the mic. And this is very uncomfortable, and it's not a one-time act. It's something we have to do continuously. This may be sometimes painful. This will feel unfair at times, like a loss, yes, but you still have to do it. We must relentlessly center the voices, needs, and rights 
and experiences of the people who are closest to the issues so that communities are represented and heard. This means nothing about us without us, full stop. And yet we see this often. You know, for example, women from low and middle income countries make up only 5% of global health decision-making. Think about it. So we really have a very, very steep curve to catch up. We need more women involved, but particularly women of color in decision-making, and we should be everywhere. Too often, the burden falls on people who look like me or come from where I come from to demand this. This needs to stop. Frankly, this is one of the most unfair things I frequently deal with. If you are committed to global health and if you are committed to equity, step up and do the work. Examine your own power and the right times to use it, to share it or to relinquish it. No one to pass the mic. We also need to elevate voices and expertise from communities of color and communities that have been historically marginalized. Change happens when communities have the power and resources to decide and drive what's best for themselves. At its core, global health is about justice, about equity, and the fundamental human right to live free. It's about people, all people, and making sure that every person can thrive. You cannot and should not ever forget that. Sometimes we get lost in jargons and acronyms and studies and fancy degrees. And it's frankly meaningless if we are not leveraging the privilege and power we have to create justice for others every single day. As I said earlier, it's not a one-time act. And not just you know, across the ocean, but right here, right now in our own communities. And that means in South Central LA, you know, never forget that global is local and there's always more we can do in our own communities to fight the health inequities we see around the world. Second, in order to fulfill your commitment to being uncomfortable and seeing the system, you need to be resilient. And COVID has made that stark, you know, clear. Being awake to the brokenness of our system and allowing ourselves to fully understand our role in it is extremely difficult. It's draining. It can be painful. It can be so exhausting. I know that. <laughs> but there is no way we can progress towards the future of justice without that. So know that it's difficult and you can still do it. Do what you need to do to take care of yourself so that you have the resilience to continue showing up for yourself and for others. This is not a short-term thing. Systems change is a long-term and incredibly complex work to do. In fact, it will outlive all of us in this virtual room. So part of your charge as global health leader is to cultivate the ability to keep showing up. Practice it. I know you can do it. We need leaders in global health who are aware and awake to this reality, and therefore also committed to changing it. And lastly, I want to urge you not to lose hope. Even taking one step means you are on the journey. From history, we know that young people are among the most effective drivers of change. You have the power to change the deeply flawed existing systems for the next generation. In Hope in the Dark, Rebecca Solnit talks about hope as a radical act you can engage in despite the reality around you. She wrote, quote, your op opponents would love you to believe that it's hopeless, that you have no power, that there's no reason to act, that you cannot win, but hope is a gift you don't have to surrender, a power you don't have to throw away. So remember this quote. You should also know that change is already underway. We see examples of movements that have tremendous power 
all around the world, you know, from millions protesting for Black lives, we are seeing racial equity as a priority for the new Biden administration. That is huge. You know, your own senator now sits in the White House as the first Black and South Asian vice president in history. Black Lives Matter was nominated the movement for the Nobel Peace Prize. So I know, we all know we have a long way to go still, but I know we are past the point of return. So do not lose hope. Amanda Gorman, the first National Youth Poet Laureate wrote in her inauguration day poem, being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. There is greater momentum for change now than I have seen in my lifetime. And so much of it is here in this country. Many of us have called home for so long. So let this moment in time fully sink in and change you really fundamentally. You have what you need to be part of transformative change. Though you may find that you will not play the role that you thought you would. I have the utmost belief in each one of you, the young people, this generation to be an active part of that change. You will face roadblocks, obstacles, and times of doubt some of them originating from other people, some of them coming from yourself. Don't believe any of that. Believe in your power to make change because we cannot accept any other option. Believe in transforming systems. And I really do hope I will see you on the way. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was amazing and powerful and, and just what we needed to hear. And in, in the words of what you said, gave me hope. I want to offer the floor now to Howard Hu, who is our Laura Thornton Chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine. And he's somebody with an amazing track record in terms of research and publications, but more important here, right now for this moment, someone with an acute sensitivity to many of these issues. My pleasure, uh, Sunait. It's such a pleasure to have you with us uh, for this event. Um, and I think your remarks were absolutely spot on. I just, uh, they resonated so much with me and I'm sure many of the audience. I'm just, I just love the idea, first of all, that you are a bi-continent person. You can really see the perspective from one continent to another. And it makes me think what we need actually is an Institute of Global Health in Addis that concentrates on the inequalities in the US because people really need to be shook up about understanding on some level the hypocrisy of spending so much resources in places where we have to do so much at home. One of the things we're proud about, at least in our department, is starting a uh, pandemic research center. The whole focus really is inequities and so much of the attention is what's happening in LA and the statistics that you show in LA are so stark uh, and we're very, very mindful of those. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, and there's a whole bunch of questions that have already surfaced in the Q and A, so I'm not gonna speak very long, is that in my experience um, in India, uh, in doing global health and comparing that with what happens in the US, one of the things that have pushed the needle the most has been the creation of a middle class. And within that middle class, the development of a civil society and India-based NGOs that can embrace these issues, in our case, uh, pollution uh, in India and the huge impacts of air pollution and the disparities that that creates, um, and really move the needle with the government by being an internal motivating source motivating civil society to protest, to put pressure on their politicians, et cetera. So how would you, I mean, we know that we have some of that plenty uh, in, in the US and of course here in LA. What's the story in your experience uh, with the global health programs in Africa? How, 
would you say is the status of civil society um, in countries in Africa? Thank you, Howard, uh, for that question. Um, so, you know, Africa has 55 countries, so it's enormously difficult to talk about all of them with any kind of, you know, I would be pretending if I, if I uh, try to attempt to speak about all of them, but I think there are general things we can draw. And I will start out, uh, certainly there is a massive gap, right? But I'll tell you why. And, and, and I'm gonna, for a split second, put my donor hat. And I think that applies not only to philanthropy, but bilateral donors and uh, universities, you know, people who work in global health. There is so much mistrust of the people we're trying to support. We oftentimes identify the problem, the solution, and we go with the resources, but we don't trust them to do the right thing. So what we oftentimes do is the funding goes to institutions that are based in the US. So I'll tell you for our foundation, um, five years ago, 95% of our money was going to international NGOs, US institutions that will go and create parallel systems that don't really enable communities. If they do, it's gonna be a very small subgrant to sort of put you know, check marks. I'm not saying uh, some of them have not worked, some have, but there needs to be a very deep investment in communities. I mean, I think 20, 30, 40 years ago, it may have been necessary to bring uh, international NGOs to do the work, but we now have the expertise so we either invest in governments directly or the majority of the time, even when we support governments, we bring international expertise to do the work with very little investments in capacity building, in forming civil societies, in investing in groups that can do the work, whether these are service delivery organizations or advocacy organizations. So there is massive need to really create a robust civil society that holds government accountable, as well as the international community accountable. One of the things that COVID-19 has made very clear is that was the travel ban that got instituted in many academic institutions and global health centers, people have not been flying in. So who's filling the void? The locals. They are somehow surprisingly finding seats and doing the work and advocating and fighting. But I think we need to do, those of us that are in academic institutions, I love your suggestion of a center for inequity. You know, global health, the globe includes, as far as I know, the United States and Canada and all this rich nation. But somehow our concept of global health is those of us with resources flying in and trying to fix. And if you remember, Howard, at the University of Michigan, we changed our global health elective or pathway to global health and disparity so that our medical students can focus on the inequities in Detroit as they were interested in the inequities in Accra or Sao Paulo or Delhi. So I think there is just a lot of work to do civil society being one, but I think we need to create a more equitable instruments that can create systems that can benefit. Like if there is, for example, hypothetically USC has a center in Los Angeles, as well as in Addis or Kigali or Joburg, there is just so much bilateral mutual benefit and learning that takes place as opposed to this notion that we're gonna go and help them and, and do that in such a way that does not empower people. So sorry for the long-winded answer, but absolute need, massive need for building not only robust civil society, but really robust systems all around. Fantastic response. Let me get into the uh, Q&A now. Here's a question from Dr. Jeff Klausner, a infectious disease specialist who's one of the newest members of the uh, Global Health Division and the institute uh, that Sophia leads. Uh, his question is, uh, what's your sense of the harms versus benefits regarding sort of data collection by race and ethnicity. There's a sense that it might mitigate racism and social justice, or might it actually perpetuate them by sort of uh, baking these statistics and expectations into uh, society? Well, I'm not a data scientist. So again, I'm gonna give a very guarded answer. 
um, in my work, I find disaggregated data super helpful, right? Like the reason why we were able to share with you what's happening in Los Angeles, uh, both the rate of infection, who's accessing vaccine, the disproportionate burden of COVID on women and girls, it is because we're getting gender and race uh, aggregated data. So in my humble opinion, if the data is used to inform programs, it is a lot more powerful than a non-disaggregated data. So in fact, there is strong push for data collection, disaggregated data collection across the world, both for COVID and other things. I mean, the reason why we know, for example, women are being disproportionately affected, both in terms of you know, frontline health work, 70% of the world workforce are women, frontline providers. So we can talk about you know, how women don't have access or healthcare providers don't have access to PPEs, right? At the beginning of uh, the, the pandemic, everyone was talking about how protective equipments were scarce. If you look at developing world where the majority of healthcare providers are women, but in addition to entering the workforce, they also are informal care providers at home. So when you do the economic analysis of COVID, you know, having gender disaggregated data has been really powerful to show who is most impacted. So, you know, even if I'm not a data scientist, I think the benefit far outweighs the risk. I mean, I think the risk is that the question is legitimate to say, could this be harmful? I mean, we know there are times where data is kept for the wrong reason, but I think if we use the data to uh, you know, for decision making and to correct the wrong and in fact to move towards a more equitable and just world, disaggregated data, both by gender and race and other things can be super powerful. Here's a question from David Schlossberg. Um, and uh, of course, you may be in a sensitive position to respond to this. But the question really, um, what about the leadership of WHO? Uh, what, what does it need to improve along the lines of what we're talking about here today? Well, I, I think that's a very appropriate question and one we all are struggling with. You know, WHO, and I don't know how much you know about the WHO, and I'm more than happy to give like a 30 second spiel, but WHO is an organization, it's basically um, has an independent secretariat, but it's run by 194 member states, which all of them have clear ideas, including global health wonks and academicians have an idea of how it ought to run, but its power is absolutely limited by what it is given. So I think the leadership of the WHO has been extraordinary. I mean, WHO right now has an exceptional leader and an incredible senior team who is doing their level best to ensure that we are staying on top of this pandemic, we're getting ahead of it. Countries are getting what they need to diagnose, treat, prevent, um, as well as get vaccines. The challenge for the WHO is its power is enormously limited. You know, the same countries, including the United States and China, superpowers particularly, and this goes for all of UN, but particularly the WHO that is supposed to be the health agency for the world, for example, has no power to go into countries and get data. It can only report what countries tell it. I mean, imagine if the United States can, if, if WHO can come and tell the Trump administration what to do. We probably could have averted 500,000 deaths that disproportionately impacted the poorest of the poor, people that are already most vulnerable. But WHO could not do that. So it's very easy to point fingers and say, where did WHO go wrong? I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's a perfect organization. It has a lot of shortcomings. But when you set up an entity to handle world health and not well resource it and not give it the mandate, you know, it has to plead and prod and play games to get data. I mean, I'm sure you all are following the fight right now between China and the United States. You know, Anthony Blinken said, you know, that you know, he wants the origin, he wants the source from China. China is saying the source is not here and it's not even you know, sharing raw data. All the WHO could do is assemble the best scientists in the world to go to Wuhan and search. But the WHO cannot force China, cannot please the US, 
and oftentimes it get drugs dragged into geopolitics and you know it's it's sort of unfair so if we want a world health organization that actually can get ahead of pandemics and and, and for those of you who have not watched you should find you know google youtube and watch um, the munich security conference of 2018 where dr tetros went out and said look we're going to get hit by a pandemic we're not prepared you know with zoonotics you know one health we have ample evidence that we're going to get hit with climate change with a virus that with antimicrobial resistance a virus that we cannot control let's build on what the Western world called global health security because we don't want it to come to us. You know, for others, pandemic preparedness. We saw Ebola, but we were not alarmed because it was not bad, right? It did not cross the borders, it stayed in Africa. So as long as it's affecting someone else, we don't worry about it. You know, but if we've learned our lessons from this pandemic, we need a well resourced and empowered WHO that can you know, identify, forecast what's to come, trigger an early, you know, warning system and not spend all its time trying to appease member states so that, you know, if they piss them off, they completely shut them out, they cut their funding. So if we want the world, hopefully the world has learned a lesson that we will, I mean, right now, everybody's asking for reform. The problem is the reform is not very little needs to be done at the WHO. Member states need to reform themselves. So if that happens, WHO can be a very powerful tool. But if we feel like, especially those in developing countries, that we have our own systems, we have our CDC, we have our NIH, we have our brilliant scientists, and we don't need it, we will, you know, history will repeat itself and the next pandemic will inevitably happen and we'll lose another, you know, millions of lives and especially the most vulnerable. People like Donald Trump in the late 70s can go get monoclonal antibodies and trial vaccine and survive, but the poorest in, you know, South Central LA will be disposed. So, so for me, yes, the WHO, there's a lot the WHO need to do, but the bigger change needs to come from member states. Folks, that was a five minute masterclass on what the WHO is all about. That's very terrific. Um, here's another question from Anushka Atulajan. Her question is, um, do you have any advice to young black indigenous women of color global health researchers? Well, I, I, I was one of them. <laughs> I remember starting and I remember how difficult it is. Um, you know, whenever people ask me, what is sort of the most difficult thing you remember before you found a platform, before you found a role? And the most difficult thing that I struggled with was being invisible. When you are a person of color, especially a woman, who's a person of color in academics, it's very painful. It doesn't matter how much you accomplish. You walk into a room and at times you can be the only person of color and you still have to reintroduce yourself about a hundred times when you should be standing out like a sore thumb. But that is sort of the reality. You know, my advice is find mentors, you know, mentors who could make their hindsight your foresight. And these mentors come and all, they don't all have to be people of color. You know, I'm one person to speak uh, who have been very fortunate to be mentored by white men who we now are out to vilify and kill because of, you know, patriarchy and misogyny. But there are a few good out there. So I was very fortunate when I came for college, the dean uh, took me under his wings and, 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 you know, partly because I was an intimidating for just a number of issues, but also, you have to have hope because if you get discouraged because someone is not paying attention, if you get discouraged because you have to be five times better, and this is very clear in medical school, there is ample data, you know, persons of color have to be 10 times as good as the average white person. It can be really tiring and it's very easy to get frustrated, let it affect, you know, it, it affects your mental health and to sort of give up. So I will say show up, organize, find mentors. Uh, I always am available, reach out, but there are so many people just looking at the screen from Professor Gruskin to Howard Hu. These are people who've mentored students. Show up, even if they are busy, they don't answer your call, pester them. 
one of them will open doors. You will connect. Also, remember, people are very busy. I remember in my young days, you know, sending one or two emails to very busy professionals and being livid that they did not reply to me. And sort of now, like, you know, it's, I, I approach that with humility and I do my best to reply to emails and texts and direct message on Twitter. But the reality is I have three to four full-time jobs, you know, being a mother of four young people and running a foundation and advising the WHO and, and my initiative at the University of Michigan, you know, I'm working towards, you know, usually about 16 hours, 18 hours and several time zones. And many people in global health are like that, especially women. They're trying to strike a balance between family and work and society's expectation and you know fight the struggles right like the daily struggles of misogyny for most professional women academics research is a very challenging environment so just sort of being aware of that being resilient showing up and organizing and reaching out to people and seeking mentorship is sort of how you get there but don't give up it's not easy it's not an easy path that's really inspirational uh, we're coming near to the end. I'm now going to turn the proceedings over back to Sophia Greskin. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. That, that, that was amazing. Thank you all for the excellent questions. Thank you, Howard, for uh, moderating. But honestly, that's a conversation that could have gone on, could go on all day and probably should, right? So I just, I just first of all, um, just to say the exploration of these issues that are so fundamental to our future, I hope is just the beginning of a conversation amongst us all. And I, I just want to close by just thanking you personally, Dr. Pasea, for what you've said, what, what you do, but the inspiration you've given to us collectively. I, I really, really appreciate it. And it is a conversation that we will continue here. Um, I thank all of you for attending. And I, I wish everybody all the best for more conversations like this. And thank you all. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs>